Welcome to the lecture on mathematical finance. In this lecture, I would like to study in detail the so-called Cox-Ross-Rubinstein model, which was originally introduced in 1979. In particular, I would like to discuss in detail on which conditions this model is arbitrage-free and whether or not that model gives rise to a complete market model. And once we have studied these two properties, I would like to focus next on pricing of European contingent claims. More precisely, I would like to compute the arbitrage-free price of European um, call and put options and of uh, barrier options. So let us have a look at the definition of that model. For, For that, that purpose, purpose let us fix a finite trading horizon DM determined by this value capital T. And I consider the index set as usual as the set of time points 0, 1 up to capital T. And then I would like to fix two parameters U and D, U standing for up and D standing for down. And you will see why in a moment, where I would like to assume that the value d is strictly larger than minus 1 and that the value u is strictly larger than p. Moreover, I would like to fix the parameter little p in the open interval 0, 1. And then I would like to consider a sequence u1 up to ut of id random variables, which, are, uh, which has the properties that the probability that u1 takes the value 1 has a probability p, whereas the event that u1 takes the value minus 1 has a probability 1 minus p. Meaning these random variables um, u1 up to ut are uh, more or less like Bernoulli random variables. And then I would like to consider a two-dimensional financial market model that I denote as usual with S bar. And it consists of a risk-free security as naught and a risky security as one. And here, the risk-free security evolves deterministically, meaning that S naught of t is simply given by 1 plus r to the power t for all t in our index set i. And this parameter r, which can be interpreted as the interest rate, um, is given by a value which is strictly larger than minus 1. And in order to uh, define the evolution of the risky security, let us first have a look at what kind of filtration we choose on our probability space omega fp. So first of all, the initial um, sigma algebra f0 is simply given by the trivial sigma algebra meaning by the sigma algebra which only consists of the empty set and the full set and the sigma algebra ft is given as the sigma algebra which is generated by the random variables u1 up to ut for any t from 1 to capital t and moreover i would like to set um, f equal to the um, sigma algebra f capital t and then the evolution of the risky security is um, described as follows. So its initial value is equal to uh, S0, which should be strictly positive. And then S1 of t is recursively defined, namely either uh, this process jumps up to the value 1 plus u times the value at the time point t minus 1, in case that the random variable u takes the value plus 1, or uh, this process at time point t jumps down to the value 1 plus d and times the value uh, s1 t minus 1 in case um, that ut is equal to minus 1. So meaning that at any time point um, t the value and um, this process um, 
ST can take are either the value 1 plus u times ST minus 1 or 1 plus d times the value ST minus 1. And here, jumping up or down should not be taken literally because in case that d is positive, in both cases the process will jump up. Uh, it will only jump down in that case if d is uh, negative, but it could also be that u is negative. So these both cases are also allowed. And this model um, is then called the cox ross rubinstein model or sometimes it's abbreviated by CRR model. So before discussing the question whether that model is arbitrary or not, let us have a look how we can rewrite this um, risky security in a slightly different way. And for that I would like to introduce the so-called uh, return of in the T's trading period, and that's the following random variable, capital R at time point T, and it's given as the increment of the price process of the risky security at time point T and T minus one, compared to the value at time point T minus one. So, and if you plug in the definition, you see that, in, in that there are only two possible values, namely um, that uh, in case that ut is equal to minus 1, this process rt will jump down to the value d, whereas in case that ut is equal to plus 1, then you see we get here t, which, uh, 2, which can just add 2, this process jumps to the value u. Summarizing, this process or this random variable rt takes two values, namely u or d, depending on whether ut is equal to plus 1 or ut is equal to minus 1. And moreover, we know that the random variables r1 up to rt are iid under p, and the probability that r1 takes the value u is equal to p, whereas the um, probability that r1 takes the value d is equal to 1 minus p. Having introduced that process of the returns, and we can now express the evolution of the um, risky security as follows. So the process as 1t can also be written as its initial value as 1 naught times the product n from 1 to little t of 1 plus rn. And likewise, we can also express and the uh, value of the discounted price process, namely the component x1 and t is given by x1 naught is simply s naught, the initial value of our um, risky price process or of the of the price process of the risky security, and x1 t is simply given as s naught times this product n from 1 to t of the ratio 1 plus rn divided by 1 plus r. And that holds true for any time point t between 1 and capital T. And moreover, we also know that the sigma algebra ft for t in the interval 1 up to capital T can either be expressed as a sigma algebra generated by the random variables as 1 not up to s 1 t, or by the sigma algebra generated by x1 naught up to x1t, due to the fact that the, our numerator evolves deterministically, or it is given as a sigma algebra generated by the random variables r1 up to rt. And here I've um, drawn for you a caricature of how this uh, price process may evolve. So you see, we start at time point zero with the value um, 1 and s naught. 1 for the amount we have of our, uh, of the price of our risk-free security and s naught the price of our risky security. So if you see in case that the random variable u1 is equal to plus 1 or likewise in case that the random variable r1 is equal to u, this process jumps up to the value 
1 plus r, comma, s naught times 1 plus u. Uh, or it can also jump down in case that u1 is equal to minus 1 or that r1 is equal to d. And then you get the value 1 plus r, time, uh, comma, s naught times 1 plus d. So let us have a look at that price process. If u2 is now equal to plus 1, this value jumps up to the value 1 plus r squared, comma, s naught times 1 plus u squared. Or can jump down in case that the random variable u2 is equal to minus 1 to the value 1 plus r2, comma, s naught times 1 plus d times 1 plus u. And you see that value can also be reached in case that um, when you first jump down and you jump up afterwards. So meaning that u1 is minus 1 but u2 is plus 1, then you also end up with that value. Whereas if u2 is minus 1, you end up with the value 1 plus r squared times s naught times 1 plus d squared. So let us address now the following question. Can we specify conditions such that the cox ross rubinstein model is arbitrary. And here's the answer. Given in terms of that theorem 3.1, consider for that uh, cox ross rubinstein model, and then the following statements are equivalent. First of all, that this financial market model is arbitrary. Second, that the parameter r is strictly in between d and u. And the third uh, property is following that there exists an equivalent martingale measure Q, which has a property that under Q, the random variables R1 up to R capital T are IID, and the pr Q probability of the event that R1 is equal to U is equal to the ratio R minus D divided by U minus D. And that ratio I would like to uh, appropriate by this parameter q. And by definition, this q takes values in the open interval 0 uh, and 1. So and in order to prove that theorem, I would like to proceed as follows. I would like to first show that a implies b, then that b implies c, and then at the end that c implies a. So let us start with the first implication that A implies B. So we assume that our financial market model is arbitrary. And in addition, let us assume for a moment that the parameter R is not in the open interval D and U. So in that particular case, I would like to define the following trading strategy. So the process H1T is defined in the following way. So first of all, h1 naught is equal to h1. Uh, h1 naught is equal to h11, and h1t is simply given as um, the indicator function that t is equal to one multiplied by a plus one in case that r the parameter r is less than or equal to d. And this indicator function that t is equal to 1 is multiplied by the value minus 1 in case that r is larger or equal to u. And obviously that process is a deterministic process. Hence, it is f not measurable, meaning that in particular it's an adapted process, or not only adapted, it's also a predictable process. Hence, we can apply lemma 2.3, which allows us to construct for a predictable process and a predictable process H naught in such a way that this two-dimensional process H naught H1 is a self-financing training strategy. And we have the freedom to choose its the value of the discounted value process at time point zero. And here I would like to choose that um, value equal to zero. So what are the consequences then? So first of all, by lemma 2.2, I can rewrite the discounted value process at maturity in terms of the discounted value 
at time point zero, which is zero by definition, so we have chosen it in that way, plus the gain process. And here you see the gain process again only depends on the component H1, meaning we do not know, have to know explicitly how H0 looks like. And in particular that in gain process was given in terms of the discrete stochastic integral between H and this discounted value process x. So let us write down explicitly what that how that discrete stochastic integral looks like. So that's nothing else but the sum n from 1 up to capital T of h1n times x1n minus x1n minus 1. So by definition we know that almost all terms hn are 0 except for the term uh, when n is equal to 1. So we end up with the value h11 times x11 minus x10. So now let us plug in the definition of x11. So for that purpose let us go back to what we have um, um, seen here. So you see x11 is nothing else but x10 times 1 plus r1 divided by 1 plus r. So I get the following. I get uh, the value as naught, which I can take out in both cases, and then I plug in the, the definition of h11, and then you see in case that r is less than or equal to d, I get r1 minus r divided by 1 plus r, and in case that r is larger or equal to u, I get r minus r1 divided by 1 plus r by taking the minus sign and the definition of h1 into that ratio. And now you see that whenever r is less than or equal to d, since the random variable r1 takes only two values, d or u, you clearly see that z random variable over here is non-negative. And the same holds true in case that r is larger or equal to u, then z random variable is non-negative. And the initial value by definition is strictly positive, meaning we have constructed here a self-financing trading strategy such that the discounted value process at maturity is non-negative. So the second thing I would like to check now is what is the probability or what can you say about the probability of the event that the discounted value process takes a value which is strictly positive. So we have seen that it's non-negative but what about strict positivity. So since all the steps we did up to that point are um, equalities, so I can rewrite that event that the value process at maturity takes a value which is strictly positive in terms of the indicator function that rn is less than or equal to d times this ratio plus the indicator function that r is larger or equal to u times that and ratio multiplied by the initial value and that complicated looking random variable should be strictly positive. But now you see this, uh, these indicator functions here are simply deterministic because we choose the little r uh, before, so that's not random. And uh, by definition, r uh, one of these two indicator functions has to be uh, uh, equal to 1. Why? Because we assume that r is not in the interval, the open interval d and u. So in case that r is less than or equal to d, we see that bit over here is not there. And we also know that s0 is strictly positive, but also that 1 plus r is strictly positive. Meaning by dividing by s0 and multiplying by um, that term and bringing then this little r on the other side, I get that that uh, probability over here can be written as the probability that r1 is strictly larger than r in case that r is less than or equal to d. And likewise I get the probability of the event that r1 is 
less than r in case that r is larger or equal to u. And now I would like to take um, an event which is contained in that event over here. Namely, if I choose the event that r1 takes the value u, using that um, r strictly less than d, we see that that event here is contained in that event. But we also know that the probability of the event that r1 is equal to u is simply equal to the value p. Likewise, in this other situation, I choose the event r1 is equal to d, and you see clearly on that event, on that indicator function, uh, then r1 is strictly less than d. And we know the probability of that event that r1 is equal to d, namely it's equal to 1 minus p. So hence we have constructed a lower bound for that probability in terms of p times the indicator function that r is less than or equal to d plus 1 minus p times the indicator function that r is larger or equal to u. And since r is not contained in the open interval d and u, one of these two indicator functions has to be equal to 1. And by the choice of the parameter p, which is chosen from the open interval 0, 1, we see that that term over here is strictly positive. Hence, we have constructed an arbitrage opportunity. So this trading, self-financing trading strategy gives rise to an arbitrage opportunity, but that's in contradiction of the statement A that our underlying financial market model is arbitrage-free. This means that the parameter R has to be chosen from the open interval in D, U. And this concludes the first implication. So let us now have a look at the implication that B implies C. So we assume that the parameter r is in the open interval d and u. And we would like to construct a measure q, which should be absolutely continuous with respect to p, which should be a martingale measure. And the random variables r1 up to rt should be iid under q and the probability of the event that r1 is equal to u should be equal to q. This we have to show. So let us start with the construction of a measure q. So for that parameter q, which simply was given by the value r minus d divided by u minus d, and my, the fact that r is in that open interval, we know that, that this parameter q takes values in the open interval 0, 1. And then I define the following measure. So for any event A taken from our sigma algebra F, I define Q of A as the expected value under P of the indicator function of this event A multiplied by the product N from 1 up to capital T of the function phi of Rn. Where the function phi is defined as the following way, phi of z, is nothing else but the ratio q divided by p times the indicator function that z is equal to u plus the ratio 1 minus q divided by 1 minus p times the indicator function that z is equal to d. So as a first step I would like to check whether or not this um, measure q we defined here is a probability measure. So let's compute q of omega. So by definition, this is nothing else but the expected value of the product n from 1 up to capital T of phi of Rn. But since the random variables r1 up to r capital T are iid under p, I can take that um, uh, product out of the expected value. And moreover, I know that the random variables r1 up to rt I identically are identically distributed under p, meaning that expected value over here can also be written as the expected value under p of the random variable phi of r1 to the power t. So now let us explicitly write down what is that expected value. So you see 
R1 only takes two values. It takes the value u with the probability p, or it takes the value d with the probability 1 minus p. Meaning I get the following expression, p times phi of u plus 1 minus p times phi of d. Now let us plug in the definition of phi. So phi of u is nothing else but q divided by p, whereas phi of d is nothing else but 1 minus q divided by 1 minus p. And now you see the p cancels out and the 1 minus p cancels out. You are left with q plus 1 minus q, which is clearly equal to 1. So 1 to the power of capital T is also equal to 1, hence we end up with 1, meaning the measure Q we defined is indeed a probability measure and by construction it's absolutely continuous with respect to P. On the other hand, we also know that the radon nicodym derivative is strictly positive P almost surely. So why is that the case? So you see the radon nicodym derivative is nothing else but that product over here. And you see that uh, one of the indi so this prefactors of these indicator functions are strictly positive, meaning this product here is strictly positive um, for any omega, and in particular it's p almost surely positive. Hence we can apply now the theorem 1.8, which implies that this probability measure q is not only absolutely continuous with respect to p, but it's actually equivalent to p. So here we have already constructed an equivalent measure. Now let us check the, uh, the distribution of the random variables r1 up to r capital T under this measure q. So first of all I would like to compute uh, the distribution or the, pro uh, the q probability of the event that rt is equal to u for any t taken from the interval 1 up to capital T. So by definition that's nothing else but the expected value under p of the event, of the indicator function of the event that rt is equal to u times this product n from 1 to capital T of phi of i. Using that the random variables r1 up to r capital T are iid under this measure p, this expected value boils down to the, to the following product of expected values, namely the expected value under p of the indicator function of r1 is equal to u times phi of r1, multiplied by the expected value under p of phi of r1 to the power t minus 1. By, but by the computation we did over here, we know that this last term is equal to 1, and so the 1 to the power t minus 1 is also equal to 1. So we only have to compute the expected value of uh, this first expected value. But on the event that r1 takes the value u, we simply get as the result of that computation the value p times phi of u. But plugging in the value of phi of q, which is nothing else but the ratio q divided by p, we get here simply q out because this p cancels then again. So we have seen that the q probability of the event r of t is equal to u is equal to q for any t. So now let us check if the random variables r1 up to r capital T are independent under this measure q. So for that I consider the q probability of the event that r1 takes values in the set a1 up to r capital T taking values in the set a capital T where these measurable sets a1 up to a t are chosen from the power set of the set um, d comma u. So by independent, so first of all, let us write down that e uh, event or that Q probability in terms of the definition. So that's nothing else but the expected value under this measure P of the product N from 1 to capital T of the indicator function that Rn takes values in the set An multiplied by 
phi of rn. So since the random variables rn are iid under p, I first can take out that uh, product from the expected value. So then I end up here with the product n from 1 to capital T of, phi, uh, of the expected value under um, p of the indicator function that rn takes values in the set a n multiplied by phi of rn and then I would like to multiply that expression by a complicated uh, one namely we have seen that the expected value under p of phi of rm is equal to 1 for any m because the random variables rm are iid under p uh, so identically distributed under p this we use here and we have computed the expected value namely the expected value of under p of phi of r1 was equal to 1. So and then I multiply that uh, t minus 1 times namely by the product m from 1 to t where m is different from n. And now I use the independence of the random variables rm which also means that the random variables phi of rm are independent to rewrite this product over here as the expected value of the product of random variables, namely the indicator function that Rn takes values in the set, Am times the product M from 1 to capital T of phi of Rm. But that's nothing else but the definition of the measure Q of the, of the event that R, Rn takes values in the set An. Hence, we have shown that indeed the random variables R1 up to R capital T are IID under this measure Q. And we have seen that the event that uh, R1 takes the value U under Q is equal to the value Q by definition. So what is left to show is that indeed this measure Q is a martingale measure. So meaning that Q is in the set M star. So for that we have to check two things. Integrability of the discounted price process under this measure Q and the Martingale property. So let us have first a look um, whether the ren this discounted price process X1 is integrable under Q. The, the discounted pro, uh, price process X0 is trivially integrable under Q uh, because that's constant equal to 1. So let us compute the expected value under Q of the modulus of X1t. So by plugging in the definition of X1t and uh, using the fact that the initial value S0 is positive, we get the expected value under Q of the product S0 times the modulus of the product N equal to 1 up to T of the ratio 1 plus Rn divided by 1 plus R. So since uh, this value over here is deterministic, I can also take it out from the expected value. And here I took advantage of the fact that our price process is adapted to the sigma algebra or to the filtration. Um, ft and the sigma algebra f0 is uh, trivial. So we uh, end up with the product as not times um, the expected value under q of the product n from 1 to t of the modulus of 1 plus in divided by 1 plus r. But since we have convinced ourselves that the random variables are 1 up to rt are iid under q, I can first take out this product from the expected value and I can replace that by the random variable Rn afterwards and I end up in that way by the following product as not times the expected value under Q of the modulus of 1 plus R1 divided by 1 plus R to the power T. But now let's compute that expected value over here. So first of all I can take out the numerator. So that's nothing else but the modulus of 1 plus r to the power minus t. 
And then I have to compute simply that expected value over here. And by two, using the triangular inequality, I simply get 1 plus q times the modulus of u plus 1 minus q times the modulus of d. Since these values over here are clearly finite, also the power uh, t of that value is finite. And since r is strictly larger than minus 1, also that prefactor over here is finite. And as naught is finite by definition, hence we have seen that uh, the components of x1t of our discounted price process are integrable for any uh, t in the interval 1 up to capital T. Hence, the discounted price process xt is in uh, 1q. Let us now check whether or not the discounted price process satisfies the martingale property under this measure q. For that, I would like to fix a time point t in the set uh, 0 up to capital T minus 1. And I would like to compute uh, the expected value under q of um, the random variable x1 t minus 1 given the sigma algebra ft. So by plugging in the definition, I can also write x1 of t plus 1 as x1 of t times 1 plus r, t plus 1 divided by 1 plus r. So first of all, we know that the discounted price process x1t, is this random variable, is ft measurable because that process is adapted to the filtration ft. Hence, we can take that measurable factor out of the condition expectation. And I'm left with computing the condition expectation under q of the ratio 1 plus r t plus 1 divided by 1 plus r. However, we have seen that the sigma algebra ft is also generated by the random variables r1 up to rt. And since the random variables r1 up to r capital T are iid under q, meaning that the random variable rt plus 1 is in particular um, independent of the sigma algebra ft. Hence, this conditional expectation boils down to the expected value of 1 plus r1 divided by 1 plus r. So let us compute that expected value. So that's nothing else but uh, q times 1 plus u divided by 1 plus r. So that in case that r1 takes the value u, and this is with probability q, or plus the value 1 minus q, times the ratio 1 plus d divided by 1 plus r. If you now plug in the definition of q, which was simply the ratio uh, r minus d divided by u minus d, and you take u minus d out, and you take 1 plus r out, you end up with the following product, r minus d times 1 plus u plus u minus r times uh, 1 plus d. And now, if you multiply out um, uh, these um, two brackets, you see that r times 1 plus u, and here you get minus r times 1 plus d, you see that the 1 cancels out, and you get here r times u minus d, and likewise if you multiply out minus d times 1 plus u, or u times 1 plus d, you see that the product or the factor u times d cancels out and only the term u minus d is left. So by taking that out, you see you cancel exactly these two factors and you get here um, a 1 from that computation, meaning you end up here the typo with x1t. Hence, we have convinced ourselves that indeed this measure q is an equivalent Martingale measure. And this concludes the proof direction that B implies C. So let us now have a look at C implies A, but that's now simple. We have an equivalent Martingale measure, and by theorem 2.8, we know that this gives rise to an arbitrary financial market model. This was exactly the statement of the first um, fundamental theorem of asset prices. 
So this concludes then the proof. So here's the next question. What about completeness of that model? So and that's the statement of the following corollary. So again, let us consider an arbitrage-free uh, Cox -Rubin, Ross Rubinstein model. And then the statement is that in that particular situation, when this Cox Ross Rubinstein model is, uh, is arbitrage free, then it's also complete. So, why is that the case? So, by the previous theorem, we know um, that um, in, in under the assumption that the Cox Ross Rubinstein model is arbitrage free, that the parameter r is in the um, interval. Um, open interval u, uh, d comma u. Moreover, we also know by the first fundamental theorem of asset prices that the set of all equivalent martingale measures is uh, non-empty. And in this previous theorem, we also constructed one element from that set m star. So now let us pick an arbitrary um, uh, equivalent martingale measure from the set M star. And let's denote that by Q Twitter. So then for any T in zero up to T minus one, we know that X T is nothing else but the conditional expectation under Q Twitter of X T plus one given F T, which is nothing else but by using the definition of F T plus one, but xt times the expected value under q-twiddle of the ratio 1 plus rt plus 1 divided by 1 plus r. So, and since by construction we know that the discounted price process is component-wise positive, we can simply solve that equation and we obtain that 1 plus r is equal to 1 plus um, d times the condition expectation under q-twiddle of the indicator function that r t plus 1 is equal to d plus u times the ex condition expectation under q-twiddle of the random variable indicator function that r t plus 1 is equal to u. And now you see this one cancels out, so we get uh, Q almost truly the following expression, namely that R plus is equal to D plus, and now we can write that indicator function also as 1 minus the indicator function that R T plus 1 is equal to U. So that's why we get here 1 minus the condition expectation under Q twiddle of the indicator function of R T plus 1 equal to U given F T plus, and we copied that term. And now you see we can solve that equation for that condition expectation um, of the indicator function that rt plus 1 is equal to u given ft. And this is by bringing, first of all, that um, d on the other side, and then by taking out here the condition expectation and dividing by u uh, minus d, which is allowed since u is strictly larger than d, we simply get that value, r minus d divided by u minus d, which was nothing else but our parameter q. So we have seen that the Martingale property immediately implies that the condition expectation under q twiddle of that indicator function given ft is equal to q, q twiddle almost true. So since we also know that by this previous theorem that Q uh, takes values in the open interval 0, 1 and that Q is deterministic, it simply follows that the um, expected, uh, no, that the um, Q twinted probability of the event that RT plus 1 is equal to U, which is nothing else but by using the definition of the condition expectation, the expected value under Q twiddle of the conditional expectation under Q twiddle of the indicator function of RT plus 1 is equal to U given FT. So we have seen that that 
condition expectation over here is equal to Q. Q is deterministic, so I can take that out from the expected value. So, and we have seen that Q twiddle of RT plus one equal to U is equal to Q for any T in the interval on the set zero up to T minus one. Meaning that the random variables R1 up to R capital T are identically distributed under Q twiddle. So let us now show that not only that holds true, but that also the random variables R1 up to R capital T are independent under Q twiddle. So again, for that I consider events A1 up to A capital T taken from the power set of the set d comma u and I consider the uh, q twiddle probability of the event that the random variable r1 takes values in the set a1 up to the uh, event that r capital T takes values in the set a t. So now let us use uh, write that as the expected value on of the product of the indicator functions um, with respect to this measure q twiddle and then use again the conditional expectation given the sigma algebra f capital t minus one and then you see that these first t minus one uh, random variables given in terms of the indicator functions that um, r1 is in the set a t up to r t minus 1 is in the set a t minus 1 is an f t minus 1 measurable random variable. So by measurable factors, I can take that random variable out of the conditional expectation and I end up here with that product. And what is left is simply the conditional expectation of the indicator function that r t is in the set a t given f t minus 1, but we just have seen that this condition expectation is nothing else but the um, q twiddle probability of the event that r t is in the set a t. But that's deterministic now, so I can take that out from this expected value. And by that I obtain first of all that factor times now the expected value of the product of the indicator function, but now this product is shortened by one factor. And I can repeat that by next consider the condition expectation given ft minus 2 and so on and so forth. I end up um, with the product n from 1 to capital T of the q twiddle probability of the event that rn is in the set an. And this then shows that under this measure q twiddle, indeed the random variables r1 up to rt are iid. And we have seen that the one dimensional marginals are equal to q, meaning more precisely the q twiddle probability that r1 is equal to u is equal to q. But this simply shows that any q twiddle a measure taken from the set of equivalent martingale measures coincides with the measure q defined in theorem 3.1c. Meaning that the set of all equivalent martingale measures consists only of a single element, namely that measure q that we specified in theorem 3.1c. And now we can apply the second fundamental theorem of asset prices, namely theorem 2.14, which then tells us that the financial market model S bar is indeed complete. So that concludes the proof of that corollary. And here's a final uh, remark. Notice that these equivalent martingale measures um, um, is in that particular situation completely independent of the choice of the physical measure um, uh, which we have chosen from the class of all probability measures such that the random variables u1 up to ut are iid and non-degenerate, meaning non-deterministic.